So, first job, identify the person you're going to target. Second, for each target, pick at least five barriers. What are the barriers that may stand between you and this person in terms of your prior relationship? Are you the right person to go ahead? Or did you insult them? Are you going to go ahead and forget it? And then, with respect to this person, what are their perceptions of you on these four places of the school? Do they think you have the right authority? Do they think you are an expert? Trust is not on or off. Trust is safe to But it helps to have a little trust in the other. And so having that investment before you go into the world, you have a favor for them, you should care about them. There's a wonderful quote from I learned from the sales man. He said, No salesman ever went hungry in the names of his customers. And I think trust comes from taking that extra effort to know stuff about people and make sure they're certain to care about them and them. And then the barriers to hearing your message, you want to make sure you minimize these um, possible disconnects between the beliefs, the interests, and the language of your sales. And that is the situation of the division. And then finally, three and four is make a pitch, and I have a question that you have to say that it's not going to be TCAN plus, and that's the model we use to make a pitch. And then secure commitments, which is make sure that when you're done here, uh, you've done your best to get them uh, as committed as they can be uh, to whatever it is you're trying to get across. All right, PK. What are you doing? PK is the answer to this problem, cause, answer, get them. What's the problem? When, when you're trying to get someone to change their mind about something, the first thing you want to ask themselves is, what's the problem with that? Why do I have to 
So you have to anticipate that and present the problem in terms of thinking. Um, often, as soon as they do think of the problem, then they want to know how we got here. So having a story about what got us here is usually a filler that gets you to the answer part, which is what you're trying to sell. But it helps to be prepared on you know what the problems are. And sometimes that's contested. Some people say it's your fault. Some people say it's your fault. Uh, if you tune in on a congressional hearing in Washington or C-SPAN or something, 90% of the time, the hearings are about one something. Who's to blame? And they're stuck at level two of PK. Uh, and uh, they, you know, every now and then they get to an answer, and then every now and then they argue about the relevant merits uh, and finally do something. But uh, a lot of times in politics, in you know, Democrat Republican politics, people are stuck at the blame level. You don't want to be stuck at the blame level. You want to get to the answer. And then, so then you present your answer and demonstrate its feasibility, you know, just this could be, this could be an answer. And then show why it's the best answer in your view compared to the alternative. So here's the cost-benefit analysis, including doing nothing. So PCAN, this, this is not my original creation. Aristotle thought this. I just gave it the <laughs> But the agents knew exactly how the bottom works, and when they constructed the, the art of rhetoric for this kind of normal, everyday, what should we do next kind of problem that everybody deals with in the world, this four step procedure is exactly the way they, they taught it, and it's exactly the way it works. So, PCAM, and then plus, plus is make it a little pivot, make it shine a little. Uh, try not to tell show. So, uh, two quick examples. Uh, there was an executive who was trying to do an efficiency uh, initiative, and it uh, turned out there were like a hundred different brands of gloves throughout this company, all over the country, in different factories, uh, in all these different places. And they wanted uh, to, to bring it down to like five different kinds of gloves to save some money. They, they had a meeting on this, and what this person did was they brought a pair of gloves of all 100 brands, and they put them in the conference room. So there were 200 gloves sitting in the middle of this conference room. And then they brought everybody in, and everybody's sitting around this conference room looking at all these gloves, and the executive leading the meeting said, you want to know what the problem is? That's the problem. And then he had a vivid demonstration that this was mindless and silly, and they got and the generals all said bomb it and there was a little uh, the state department people said let's blockade and in the middle of this discussion bobby kennedy slipped a little note to his party general bobby kennedy was the party general and on the note it said now i know how tokyo felt just before his generals persuaded him to bomb the bomb it was a historical analogy John Kennedy wanted no part of being seen as someone who would uh, surprise bomb the Cubans and their society without any warning or any uh, sort of ability to negotiate. And so they put a blockade in, it turned out to work. But the most important thing is Bobby Kennedy knew how to persuade his brother. And a little historical analogy is that. So to get to that commitment part, our last thing, don't ask for promises, don't ask for agreements, ask for actions. Ask for actions that could be observed by other people. Uh, so get them to send an email to more than just you. Uh, get them to join your task force, introduce you, present the idea, promote the idea to others, and then find the resources, time, space, people, priorities. Because when people take action that can be observed by others, their commitment level rises dramatically compared to just promises and agreements and promises and promises. So, uh, so that gets us to the final slide and just a summary here. Why is this important? Because authority is not enough. You have to be skilled in some ideas to set the mission, turn the path, or achieve the mission. 
What is it? We're talking about strategic dissuasion, integrated setting, influence, persuasion, negotiation skills that can drive change within complex systems. And then how do we do it? We got a research-based four-step process, PCAN plus, PKN plus, that will take your idea, my idea, and get it. And problem, cause, answer, net benefit, in that order, one person counts. That's what I've got for you. Look forward to your questions. I don't ask if it'll go viral. I can figure out how to make it viral. That is an absurd thing to say. <laughs> That's Jenny Foyos, an 18-year-old YouTuber who is absolutely crushing shorts. She's done over 600 million views in the past year alone, averaging 10 million views per video. How does she do it? I have analyzed thousands of shorts. I analyzed all of Mr. B's shorts, all of Ryan Trahan's shorts, and what I found was... In this episode, you'll learn how to make anything go viral. I think you can make a video about anything. It's just adding kind of... How to create the perfect short. Every second counts on a short. Like, every single second. Whatever you say you're going to do, you end it right after you do it. The differences in short-form content platforms. Short-form content is not the same across platforms. I noticed that YouTube likes and a hot take you might not be expecting attention doesn't matter as much as people think it does you said this kind of aside you said well i can make anything good. like if the idea is good i can make it i can make it good. <laughs> which is an absurd thing to say and i want to hear what that means to you how do you how do you make anything go viral it's just adding story and twist especially with shorts since like no one's actually having to click on your video i think you can make a video about anything you can make video about peak crime and you can make it entertaining if there's a story around it and if the viewer is invested what are your favorite ways to get people invested how do you how do you make a story that people care about i think my content is very personality based i'd say so for me making it personal makes them invested i'll give you an example i actually did this in a longer form in the video i coax for strangers to make money Okay, very baseline. Why should they care? Well, my kitchen is broken and I want to raise money for it by cooking and making money. You know, it's, it's ironic. Like, I'm, my kitchen's broken, so in order to fix it, I have to cook to make money. So I think that's what makes people invest in having like some sort of personal why or goal. And irony, too, is pretty good. I like that. Juxtaposition. Jenny's the hero of the story. Exactly. <laughs> what makes a good short? When I think of good, it's very subjective. So there's no direct definition as to what makes a good short because everyone has different tastes. But I could say what makes a good short to me. Okay, let's do that. To me, a good short is one that has a strong hook. And the way I like to explain it is it, it could be used as a title and thumbnail on a long form, like it will still get clicks. You know, work for a short. You know, so the hook needs to be very, very specifically good. designed to deal with our troops and steal those shoes. And it needs to be so simple, like so simply said, like you said, explained to a viral. So I think that's one of the key things. And then also just a story that just you know pushes you through. And not only do you watch the end, but you rewatch it again. So that's what makes it interesting. Let's say that you are planning or want to create a new video. How do you start thinking about hooks, or how do you generate hooks? It's it's very funny because I like to I like to see shorts like as like even though I don't do them in long forms I like to see shorts as if I'm making like a long form so like I will sketch almost as if it's titled like, thumbnails so, like I have my iPad and I draw like what would I visually want it to look like what are different ways if I was to put it together what would that look like so when I'm making a hook I just like keep drawing and sketching or like even just imagining until something just clicks so it's the first thing is the visual. Easily. The first thing is the visual, and then I figure out how I'm gonna accompany that visual. And what I'm saying, I try to make it as concise as possible, and I'll put it in a readability checker and make sure that it's actually like understandable to at least like fifth grader on your What's what's the readability checker that you use? Uh I don't I don't know, I don't pay for it. It's readabilityformulas.com is the one I use. And you wanna be fifth grader on Fifth grader. Yeah. Have you, have you played around with things that are uh, older, quote unquote, than that, and seen that that's the level that it should be at, or how did you arrive at fifth grade? 
Yes, so I have analyzed thousands of shorts, as you may know. So I've like scraped, you know, the scripts of a bunch of shorts and I've put it in this readability checker. And I've noticed that the most popular shorts, especially Mr. Beast, you know, Mr. Beast is one of the best shorts creators, and his is like in first grade level. So I just basically like after scraping everything, that's when I realized like fifth grade and under is like about the range you want to be at. Yeah, I think yeah, it's so simply put, yeah. How did you rate that fifth grade? Is that the average of all of these? I'm not gonna lie, the readability can sometimes be off, but it was um it was just like at a range. Cause I, I believe like like Eric, for example, is like slightly higher. I don't know the exact number at the top of my head. But I, I just noticed that like a good in between is fifth grade. But I will say the problem with the readability is especially like with content like mine. You can change the readability from fifth grade to like eighth grade by simply using the word business. So I try to avoid things like that or use the word finance. Or if you use like, for example, profit, instead of saying profit, I just explain the definition of profit every time I talk about it. I did not know this about you. I did not know that you analyzed thousands of shorts by scraping the titles and the transcripts. Can you tell me more about that? <laughs> yeah, so, like, it's so funny because like, basically the way I do it is when you go onto YouTube, you want to the short. It sends you like, even on desktop, it sends you to like this shorts page or whatever. Yeah. But if you change the URL to like watch question mark V equals then the URL, then it will send you to like the actual YouTube page and then you can just click transcript, copy and paste that transcript, and then I just check the readability. But also like check other things. You know, I just analyze why these shorts are working. So interesting. So interesting. I, yeah. I would love to hear anything else that comes to mind as you were looking at all of this that started to help you pull together your own short strategy because I did not realize that you had done all this research and pulled all this together. This gets me very, very excited. As the creator science guy, I am <laughs> super yeah. excited about this, this research. Yeah, so I've also like deeply analyzed all of my videos and I think that's where you learn the most. Everyone has different audiences, so what works for Mr. Beast might not work for me, right? So what I did was like I did my own little experiment. Like when I knew I wanted to get into shorts, I told myself I was going to upload every day for as long as possible. And I think I only got like a week or two in. It, it didn't, it, 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 I, didn't, I didn't get that far, but the goal was essentially to upload as much as possible. Quantity is what makes quality. When I was doing that quantity, I would analyze my retention graph. And this is just like one example I'll just pull out for you. So there was one video after five days, I got I think like 50,000 views in five days, right? Which I, on average, I used to get like a million. <laughs> so I was not happy with the performance. And I pulled up the retention graph, and I noticed on the last second, it was a huge dip. It was 70%. One second later, it was 45%. Like a 25% drop in one second. And the retention was 83%. So what I did was I went to the YouTube studio. I turned off that one second. YouTube removed this feature, by the way. YouTube, please bring it back. But just by re removing that one second at the end, it went from 83% to 88%. And the video went down. And that, that's why like every second counts on the show. Like, every single second. Because when you think about it, let's say you have a 30 second show. Right? If you lose one second, that's already 97%. That's three percentages. You know, if you lose two seconds, it's six percent. So when you think about it, I'm sure it's like you're not just losing one second, you're losing double or even triple because that one second accumulates to two or three percent of the video. The takeaway here, I believe, is that you really want in a short high retention, of course, without high retention and everything. But I've heard some people talk about you really want people to sometimes loop and watch even into a repeat yes. of the thing. Is that true? Yes, yes. And I'll explain why. The average scroll through rate, which is basically like on YouTube Shorts, you can see what percentage, like what percentage of people viewed versus swiped away. And I like to call it scroll through rate. But the average scroll through rate is like 70%. You want to get that as high as possible. My personal scroll through rate is like 85%. So my average scroll through rate is 85%, but my average retention is 95%. If only 85% of people are watching it, how does the retention suddenly get to 95%? It's because they're re-watching it. So to have that like 90 plus percent retention, which is like, in my opinion, the bare minimum, like for a short to blow up, you need them to watch it again.
So 90% is your benchmark. That's what you're looking for, for retention, for something that will have the, the virality and reach that you are accustomed to at this point. For the most part, yes. I will say it depends on the amount of impressions because my videos average like 95% retention, but we're talking like that's on 10 million views. So that's like, it's very difficult to do it. Right. So, yeah. Okay, so you mentioned that with the hooks, you think about the visual nature. Are you talking about the first frame of the actual video? Yes, I'm talking about the first frame. I don't know how many shirts you've seen, so I'll try and uh, explain it. But I, I've seen more than one, but less than you. <laughs> so let's let's assume yes. on the low end. Yes. Yeah. So I have this series where I remake fast food items for a dollar. Instead of like showing my face, I show the location. I show the front of the location. Because obviously, like, more people know the fast food location than they know me. The easiest way to describe like the video just visually is by showing the fast food item in front of the location. So usually it's so funny. I'll have the logo in the middle, and then I'll put the food item here, and then right in the middle, I'll put like one dollar burrito, one dollar sandwich, one dollar burger. So then it's like you perfectly see it. It's always perfectly aligned, and it really helps for benchability too because it's actually a playlist, and I get a lot of views from people like just like watching it down, and they they just know it's me every time they see that thing. So interesting. Was this all trial and error, or did you model this this style of, of framing and hook off of anyone in particular? It's definitely like trial and error. At first, I started by, I guess you could say, stealing. Like stealing like an artist, because that's how, to me, I, I believe that's how you learn. Sure. You obviously want to find your own style. But I started by like copying other people's looks, and I was looking at like, which percentage is the highest? So, I, it sounds so funny. So it's like a, a strategy, a technique is like, what would it sound like if this YouTuber made this video? And then I would make a bunch of hooks depending on that. So I'll have like a list of like the big 10, and then I'll just like, you know, have a bunch of different hooks. Pick which is my favorite, see the percentage, and then assess what's the best hook. Then I made my own twist into it. After a quick break, Jenny walks me through her process for coming up with great ideas. So stick around, we'll be right back. If you know me, you know how much I believe in memberships. My membership is the core of my business, and I believe that earning a living directly from your audience is one of the most sustainable ways for you to become a professional creator as well. So I want to tell you about today's sponsor, Uscreen. Uscreen is a beautiful all-in-one platform that helps content creators earn a living from their videos by unlocking predictable recurring revenue. You can host private live streams for your members, build an on-demand catalog of premium video content, and Uscreen gives you a community hub to interact with your members too. They can access your community from their mobile phone, so your membership is right there in their pocket. With a Uscreen account, you get video hosting, an out-of-the-box website, full payment and subscription management, and plenty of third-party integrations too. And Uscreen makes it easy to get set up. You get access to powerful website themes that are fully brandable with no coding skills required. Uscreen is the platform for building a video membership site that is great for generating a sustainable income stream for professional creators. To try Uscreen, click the link in the description and let them know that Jay sent you. What would you say is your proportion of like video ideas to videos you actually create? <laughs> oh God. What? Right now in a Google Doc, I have a list of a thousand ideas. Crazy. And I'm only doing ten. Crazy. So, so these are it depends. these are a thousand ideas, not a thousand hooks, a thousand different video ideas. I can each have multiple different hooks with them. Yes, it's 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 crazy. Yeah. Where do they come from? How do you generate that many ideas? Okay, there's a lot of ways. So one way is I just watch YouTube and then see what I personally you know want to recreate and twist or. It's like, what video do I want to watch? Or, um, it's funny as it sounds, I also use AI. AI has like, pretty good ideas. But the best ideas, at least for me personally, they come from just making it and then thinking, this is a video idea. So let me explain that. 
So one of my most popular videos is me making the organ. It's funny as it sounds, because it sounds like it would get no views yet it has like it has like 30 million views. <laughs> so it's fun. I wish so many ideas for something like this happened. One day I was eating ratatouille and it was like one of my favorite foods. Right? And I'm like, I can't believe like it costs $20. And I'm like, look, can't I just make a garden and then have unlimited ratatouille for like five bucks? I'm like, oh my gosh, that's a video idea. So I'm like, now I gotta make a garden and then I'm gonna grow vegetables to have infinite ratatouille because it's my favorite food. So like, that's where the story came from. For like another time, my grandma, she was so funny. She got like, like I think it was like laundry detergent in the mail. Oh my gosh, like free laundry detergent. I'm like, why should you get free laundry detergent? That's like 30 bucks. And she was like, oh, I called the company, and I complained to them, I told them that they suck, and they sent me free laundry detergent. I'm like, that's a video, I gotta do that. <laughs> so it's like, you know, just the things that I live, and then I'm like, that needs to be a video. Those are my best ideas. So how do you go from a thousand ideas to narrow it down to ten? What is the deciding factor of which videos make you better? <laughs> so I would say I narrow it. I narrow it down to like, like let's say we have a hundred, because a hundred is like an easier number to work with. So let's say we have a hundred ideas. I'll narrow it down to like twenty-five. 25 to 50. That's usually just based on like, the first thing I ask myself is do I want to make it? I don't ask if it will go viral. I can figure out how to make it viral if I really want to make it. So first I tell myself, do I actually want to make this? Is this actually logistically possible? And then it's like, is the hook good? Is the mechanism good? Are people going to rewatch this? Then that's when I look at like, where's the virality aspect of this? Then I'll bring it down to 25. Then from there, I'll send it to, um, my video editor, who's also like, he's just like, he's really involved in the channel, so it's not just a video editor, he's also like a strategist, because, you know, he's, he, he knows a lot about YouTube. And, um, I send it to him, and he'll bring my 25 to like 10. And he'll basically, he'll go in and tell me like, even further if it actually seems viral, if he thinks it's shareable. But for him, like, he's really good at telling if, if a concept is simple, yet complex, if that makes sense. You mentioned a word a second ago, you said, is the mechanism good? What do you mean by mechanism? If they're going to be pushed to the end. So like, a good example is Mr. Beast, the red circle, like, is it like, last the leaf circle wins $500,000. The mechanism is the circle is constantly closing. So the viewers are watching till the end. So if, if it was just like, the circle wasn't closing, I don't know if anyone watched to the end. They'll just skip to the end, probably. Interesting. What are some of the mechanisms that you've used? I think this is the easiest one that anyone can buy. It's basically saying, there's three steps, or there's three things you need to do, because it's very easy to follow, and you just show the list of three, so now the viewer knows that, oh, we're getting closer to a video, like, they actually need to get a presentation, which is probably one of the biggest things. I think that's, I think that's why my videos, like, go viral, it's because people have a good expectation of what they're going to watch and what's actually going to be at the end. So when it comes to expectations, if you set expectations, do you find that then the, the next step is completely following through those expectations, or do you ever try to like subvert expectations for an element of surprise or something? I try to follow those expectations, but then have a twist. For example, I gave my mom a $5 Mother's Day gift. The hook was, my mom's never had a Mother's Day gift, so I'm gonna change that and buy her the best present with $5. It was, it was Hawaii making me appear in the hook. My mom's never had a Mother's Day gift, so I'm gonna change that. But the expectation is, so I'm gonna surprise her with a gift for $5. And on screen, I'm showing me giving her the gift, but you're gonna see that till the end. So it's like, it's the, the cold open, and then we cut to the video. So the expectation is, by the end of the video, you're gonna see me give her a gift. So then I follow through, make the gift, and then I surprise her. Now I gave them the expectation, I close the loop that I'm gonna surprise her with this gift. But the twist was, she ended up dropping the gift, it broke, and then she's like, you're the best daughter I've ever had. I'm like, ah, I'm the only one, the video ends. <laughs> So it's like, yeah, I, I gave that expectation that I'm going to gift her, and then we just twisted it at the end. How long would you say, on average, your shorts are? 
Oh, I know exactly the answer because I've done the analysis. <laughs> it's, it's exactly 34 seconds because my most popular videos are exactly that length. So I try to make it exactly that length. I think that was going to be my next question was to say, is, do you, is that now your, your benchmark for what you're looking for in a video, 34 seconds? Yes. So, yes. Yeah. Everyone's is different. Everyone's going to analyze it like, through their, their own channel. And I think I've seen, well, I was in, uh, I was in Kai Galloway's Accelerator, and he showed some research that he had done to show, like, depending on your short length, this is the bar for retention you should be shooting for. So I'm guessing that 90% retention is also related to the average total length of your videos, whereas if you're shorter, maybe you need retention to be higher to achieve the same environment. Exactly, yes, correct. So for me, for my personal channel, like I said, like there's no specific number. I think everyone just has to check out their analytics. But for me, I noticed if a short is less than 30 seconds, it needs to, it has to have over 100% retention or else it's not going to take off. So that's why I like to make it slightly longer. But too long is too long for my audience since I do have a very young audience. If you know that you want your video to be about 34 seconds, I'm thinking if it's 34 seconds and you know that you want your last second retention to be really high, it seems like the payoff is like literally the last second. So now we got 34, 33 seconds. You probably know how long your hook generally is, so maybe that's you know, three seconds or five seconds, and you have this remainder of 28 to 30 seconds in the middle. Do you break that down into specific pieces of the mechanism, or is that just kind of whatever happens? Yeah, so it's usually whatever happens in the edit, but what I do check is before I film the video, I will do a rough script. Even if it's not even what happens in the video, like I'll just roughly you know, do it and I can just change it later. And from there, I'll have a sense of how long it is just from the word count. But I don't necessarily force it. I just let it free flow, like you said, in the edit. But I do have a rough idea of the word count and my hooks and foreshadow. I always do that in every video. I do a hook and then I foreshadow, which is two lines. And that is usually three seconds or less. And foreshadow, you're saying that's in... That's in the voiceover. Because I know you mentioned like the, the example of your, your mom's gift. When you see her grab the package, that's foreshadowing way, but that's completely visual. You're saying you dedicate some spoken time to foreshadowing as well. Yes, I always have spoken time to foreshadow it. Like it doesn't matter what video idea it is. Like, like, like let me just pull up like a, a random idea. Like I'm going to the beach, right? And then it's like, why was my watch? So that's the book. I'm going to the beach. What's the foreshadow? I'm going to the beach and I'm going to surprise someone with $100 at the end of the video. It could literally be with anything. It just needs to have some sort of expectation. I want to keep going down this, this structure rabbit hole a little bit more because I keep finding new layers. Like I didn't know foreshadowing is part of your structure. So is there anything that comes after the book and foreshadowing that is a structural part of everything? Yes, there actually is. <laughs> so it will usually be hook, which is really short. Then I'll foreshadow what's going to be at the end. Then I have to smoothly transition. So I used to have like a lot of breaks because you want to give people time to breathe, right? Because you don't want to be like, I'm going to be doing this and this and this and this and this and the video's over. I didn't, like, they, they're not going to understand anything. So you want a pacing break without the pacing actually breaking. But let me explain what I mean by that. This I did this in my recent video. So it was like, McDonald's banned this item. Hook. So I'm going to make it at home, then convince them to put it back on the menu. That's the foreshadow. And then at first I wrote, let's get started, but that breaks pace. So instead of saying, let's get started, I said, so I cooked illegally and that, that just flows better. So I, I don't want to give like, cause I already gave like two crucial pieces of detail. So if I give any more detail, they're just going to forget about that. The primacy recency, if you, yeah, I can get into that. So it's like, they're going to forget what I just said. So we need a pacing break without the pacing action break. Yeah, totally. Okay, let's keep going down this, this trail. Is there, is there more structural pieces past the transition? Usually, it's just like problem, solution, or but therefore storytelling. Okay. Tell me more about but therefore storytelling. Basically, but therefore storytelling, but therefore storytelling, simply put, is just lots of change in the story. So a story, stories can't be stories about change. For example, I went on a walk. Then it started raining. Then I went back home. It was much more boring than if it was like, I went on a walk. 
when it started raining. Therefore, I started running back home, and I, I, I was raining all over me. But good thing I had a handy umbrella while I was on my way back. Therefore, I got home. Like it's the exact same story, but it just sounds so much more intriguing when you have like but and then so. But therefore, I'm so glad that you're able to like whip up these examples on the fly. This must be very stressful. Uh, <laughs> the spots I'm putting you on, but you're just like, I got it. <laughs> yeah. So if I'm thinking from an order of operations standpoint, I'm, I'm making some assumptions I'm realizing. I want to make sure I'm correct again. It sounds like you have ideas first, then you narrow that down to a small number of ideas, and ultimately a video that you say, yes, this idea, editor, and I have decided this is a good one. Uh, you come up with versions of the hook, and then it seems like you, you start recording. And after recording, you start editing, and then after editing comes the transcript for the voice. Did I get that right? You were close. You were close. Like you said, ideas, then I find that one idea. Then I'll write my hook. Then I'll write the last line. Mm. So I always know the last line. Okay. Then I'll go back, and then after the hook, I figure out how I'm going to foreshadow that. I, I will always have the hook, foreshadow. so I always have two lines. <laughs> so it would be like hook, foreshadow, and um, but in between, it would be like, it depends on the video. Sometimes it will be a rough script, like we were saying, so I can have that structure in mind. Or it will just be bullet points of things I want to touch on while I'm filming. Then I will film. Once I've filmed, I will revisit the script again, revise it, finalize it, then it goes in edit. How do you write the last line without knowing what comes out in the filming? It's, you'd like leave it in blank. So it would be like, for example, if I'm surprising someone with a gift, the last line would be, that's <laughs> like, it's so simple. Then I surprise my mom and, and then blank. Um, so it's usually, it's, it's you know, reaction. just to have a general idea. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Okay, I was watching your videos this morning and I, I was like really, I, I took note of the fact that they all end very abruptly. But like not in a way where I'm like, what happened? It's it's like it's pleasing, but it is abrupt. And we already talked about how you you kind of learn this, you turn it off. But it is like, I surprised my mom, and you know, and then, and then her reaction. You mentioned a moment ago that the age of your audience is a little bit younger. How much do you think about who the audience is when you think of ideas? You know, because in my world, you just step back a second. In my world, a lot of times, folks have like a very specific avatar that they're creating for, who's trying to achieve some sort of specific goal. I don't think that's the same in more of the entertainment space. So I'd love to hear to what level of detail you think about an audience member in your life. Yeah, that's everything. Avatar is everything. So for me, I will think of like specific people. So I would think of like me when I was younger. I think about like these, these are my favorites to think about. By the way. My my nieces are ten years old. Ten. I have two nieces that are seven and ten, and they just moved to America last year. So they barely understand English, and that's that's who I want to speak to. It's it's very tough because they might not be interested in the topic, but if I can make them interested, and especially if it makes sense to them as non-English speakers, it's probably really good. So that's the way I see it. It's not necessarily thinking of like. Their, their dreams, their desires, but more so, how can you speak to them? So it's just, it just, I don't know if that makes sense, but it's like, it's, it's different. It, it makes sense. It's interesting for me to hear because I just don't speak to folks on the more entertainment side of the creator world as often. So actually, it's, I'm just coming at natural curiosity to hear how you do think. I would imagine the level of views you're getting, tens of millions on these, on these videos, it's a broad spectrum of people who are looking at this. So who do you, who do you choose as the core of, yes, people outside of this type of person, maybe my nieces, will watch this, but I'm making it for this person in particular. I didn't know if you had that specificity or not. Mm, like I said, I do and I don't. So it's in the sense of like, I, it's mainly like my younger self, which is like kind of weird because I can't actually, my younger self can't actually watch it. But that's like the way I think it, which is what makes sense. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Can we talk a little bit about 
Instagram Reels and TikTok and how you think about those. Because a lot of times people think short form vertical videos, same everywhere, choose wherever you're leading and then just post it to all three. And it's clear that your your YouTube is is much bigger than the other two platforms. Mm -hmm. Those other platforms are much bigger on, so that's not a judgment here. So I'm curious <laughs> what you're hearing or what you're experiencing in terms of how this does or does not translate. Hey, real quick before they respond, I want to let you know that there are bonus audio only episodes of Creator Science that air every Tuesday when we don't publish a video. Episodes like number 156, where I talk with my editor, Connor, about our first year on YouTube, or number 37 with Ollie Abdul. If that's interesting, just search for Creator Science wherever you listen to podcasts. All right, back to the show. Yeah, so short form content is not the same across platforms. And I know this because I used to do very well on TikTok before I was doing that on YouTube. In fact, when I had like a thousand subscribers on YouTube, I had like 70K on TikTok. So I was doing much better and I was averaging like a million views per TikTok. What was crazy is, I remember at this, at this point, I was posting to all three platforms. But TikTok was getting all the views. YouTube Shorts and Instagram Reels were getting like nothing. Were you thinking about one of those platforms as like your the platform at that time? It was definitely TikTok. So you're thinking, I'm making this video for TikTok. I'm also posting the Reels and I'm also posting the Shorts. Correct. But it wasn't edited on the TikTok app. Like it would still be filmed, you know, like professionally and then edited it and then posting on TikTok. The same video that would get one million views on TikTok, you get a thousand views on YouTube Shorts. And I was like, okay, let me just switch a track because I bought a band on TikTok like, for a short period of time. I'm like, let me focus on YouTube. And then the opposite happened. I started averaging 1 million views on YouTube and then 1,000 on TikTok. I'm like, this is really strange. Like, these platforms definitely want different content. And what I found, YouTube likes definitely a slower, more mature, you know, it's a more mature audience, so they want like a slower pace, more story. So those would be like the 34 second tick, uh, 34 second shorts that I make. TikTok, on the other hand, did not like, <laughs> did not like videos over 30 seconds. It liked 10 to 20 second videos that were just like dense with information, not that many jokes, just like, you know, just, just scrollable. They're just trying to scroll as much as possible. There's Instagram Reels, was also slightly more mature, but because they have that mute feature, a lot of those videos would be very visual and would have like subtitles in every second and would have like a lot of shareability since it's very it's, it's very easy to share on Instagram. What do you think about long form now? Is it something that you aspire to do more of? How does it play into the Jenny Hoyos universe? Yes, the Jenny Hoyos universe sounds like the MCU. <laughs> but yeah, I, I really want to get into long form. I want to become established there. Basically, what I did to shorts is exactly what I'm going to long form. I've been studying long forms for the past year, learning as much as I can, analyzing everything. Now it's just time to execute. So the goal is to pull up what I did on shorts on long form, and then just you know upload a uh, upload a, a good amount between them. I'm never going to put shorts. It's just an idea of balance between the two. What does long form represent to you that it's a priority? You know, you're so good at shorts, you're you're like at the top of the mountain. Why is long form something that's calling to you? You know, I think I mean, just a lot of reasons. I feel I, it's kind of tough saying it, but I think that they, simply put, I don't see that much more growth for me in shorts. Like, sure, I can start averaging like 100 million views, but it's like the real growth and fun is going to come from learning long form. It's all about the journey. You know, it's like, um, it sounds so bad to say, but I feel like I've already achieved my goal for the You know, it's like, I, I want to, you know, challenge myself again. I just don't feel like I'm challenging myself with this. This is the best thing to Yeah, that's valid. I your your reasons are your reasons. They're totally valid. I was, I was I was wondering if it had anything to do with like is the relationship to the audience different? Or, or, I'm sure there's more money in it. I was wondering if those were part of the decision or if it was just a you know trying to climb a new mountain type situation. I will say as I go as a trans, money is not the reason. But when I first like started my entrepreneurship journey, money is everything, right? But then when I I started YouTube, I realized like. It doesn't matter how much I make money. I'm just doing this. So money, like, it's crazy. As funny as it sounds, my content is all about money. I don't even care how much I'm doing. 
funny as it sounds. It's weird how it works. But yeah, it, yeah, the, yeah. It's just I think I think there is a better relationship with the viewer. I feel like it's just it's just more it's more it's more personal. You know, like you guys are spending more time together. For sure, I think it is like a time spent situation. Like I feel like we really build trust as a function of time spent, and the more spent time you spend, the more of a relationship you build. Relationships are built on trust. Curious if you think that your shorts audience will transition into long form, or if you're thinking about the audience themselves the same. Are these long form videos also going to be for your music? It's, it's a different audience. You know, it's really funny. I want to tell you story because I thought it was absolutely hilarious. It's just gonna open up. Like, I just knew it was fishy. I had a little cousin visit my house. It was the first time I met her. She was a little cousin. And she's like seven years old. She came to my house first and she said, "My cousin's a famous YouTuber." And so, like, but the second thing she said, she was like telling me, "I like she loves my shorts." She's like, "You know what you should check out?" I was like, "I was on YouTube and I noticed they had these like." Four songs or videos that are like shorts, but just like long. <laughs> and I was like, that was crazy. That was crazy. That's crazy. That type of thing breaks my mind. It's like it's like the videos where it's like we ask Gen Z to listen to, and it's like it's a fan from my childhood here. I'm like this is bad. <laughs> exactly. It was one of those moments where we realized the audience is there's a really two different audiences. Is there some people who only really know long forms or thing, and vice versa? So people that only know short forms, and there's people that know both. So I know I'm gonna get, you know, I'm not gonna get. All of my audience. I have had some audience transition, but yeah. And you think that's a is that a YouTube thing or is that an audience preference? I think it's an audience preference. I think YouTube seems it's something that comes together. Like YouTube creators, like I don't think it's a YouTube thing. This is not audience, but all of them are YouTube creators with millions of subscribers. And then the only thing that they can have is a YouTube channel. And then they're like, it's YouTube's fault. Yeah. But the reality is, like, it's different, you know. Like, um, I average like 10 million views on shorts, and then long forms, I'm averaging like 50k views. You know, so it's like, I think they're doing a pretty good job at like transitioning. There's obviously not everyone's going to transition. All right, last question. I want to ask you: Is there anything that you believe to be true, Logan, related to YouTube or shorts, but you don't yet have data to support? Oh, there's there's a couple. I'm trying to think what I should. I, I think I got a couple. I'm gonna say two. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna say two. Okay. Okay. I think sure it really matters, but I haven't done an analysis on that yet, and I feel like doing an analysis is is very tough because there's a lot of factors that go into play. Because, you know, I could argue this video has a lot of shares, which I grew up, and I could also just argue that I could have shared this So, you really know, I, I don't know. So, that, that's my name. I think you should be able to do that stuff. Although, I will say, like, one of my shorts, it has, like, such high shares. It has, like, what, like, the uh, shares to do this show. It's 20%, which is extremely high. And this filter rate is, like, 92%. It's insane. And there's probably because the shares are, are that high. And then my second one is that the attention doesn't matter as much. I think it does. Say more. It's very interesting because I have a lot of friends, like, who will send me their retention graphs or, like, their data, their analytics. And there's people like within like a similar amount of impressions as me, like their attention would be so much higher than mine. And there's friends like you would have like a 40 second short that has like 100k views and over 100 percent retention. I'm like, oh my gosh, you're just gonna get like 10 million views and like it's kind of a niche either. And you don't ever guess it. And for me, like the niche is crazy. Like I had a short before where it had like 70 percent retention on the short 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 That is an absurd thing to say. <laughs>
that's Jenny Hoyos, an 18-year-old YouTuber who is absolutely crushing shorts. She's got over 600 million views in the past year alone, averaging 10 million views per video. How does she do it? I have analyzed thousands of shorts. I've analyzed all of Mr. B's shorts, all of Ryan Trahan's shorts, and what I found was... In this episode, you'll learn how to make anything go viral. I think you can make a video about anything. It's just adding... How to create the perfect short. Every second counts on a short. Every single second. Whatever you say you're going to do, you end it right after you do it. The difference is in short form content platforms. Short form content is not the same across platforms. I noticed that YouTube lives and a hot take you might not be expecting. Attention doesn't matter as much as people think it does. Which is an absurd thing to say. And I want to hear what that means. How do you how do you make anything go viral? It's just adding story to a twist. Especially with shorts, since like no one's actually having to click on your video. I think you can make a video about anything. You can make a video about pink wine. You can make it entertaining if there's a story around it and if the viewer is invested. What are your favorite ways to get people invested? How do you how do you make a story that people care about? I think my content is very personality based, I'd say. So for me, making it personal makes them invested. I'll give you an example. I actually did this in a long form. In the video, I coaxed for strangers to make money. Okay, very baseline. Why should they care? Well, my kitchen is broken and I want to raise money for it by cooking and making money. You know, it's, it's ironic. Like, I'm, the kitchen's broken, so in order to fix it, I have to cook to make money. So I think that's what makes people mess it. I think I'm just sort of personal why or, or an iron to this video. Jenny's the hero of the story. Exactly. What makes a good short? When I think of cook, right? It's very subjective. So there's no right definition as to what makes a good short because it's like different case. But I can show you what makes a good short case. Okay, let's do that. To me, a good short is one that has a strong hook. And the way I like to explain it is it, it could be used as a title or something like that. Uh, like one, like a full stage that fits. You know, it works for a short. You know, so the hook needs to be very visual. You need to understand it without even listening to it. And it needs to be so simple. Simple, it's so simply said, like you said, explain to a five-year-old. So I think that's one of the key things. And then also just a story that just, you know, pushes you through. And not only do you watch them again, but you rewatch it again. So that's what makes it interesting. Let's say that you are planning or want to create a new video. How do you start thinking about books? So how do you generate books? It's, it's very funny because I, like I like to see the shorts like that's like, even though I don't do any more films, I like to see the shorts as if like I'm making a lot So like, I will sketch almost as if it's kind of context. So like, am I trying to draw like, what would I do to do that with it? And there's different ways that I was to put together what would that look like. So when I'm making a book, I like to draw and sketch it. Or like, even just imagine until something just flips. So the first thing is the visual. Easy. The first thing is the visual, then I figure out how I'm going to accompany that visual. And what I'm saying, I try to make it as concise as possible. And I'll put it in a really good way to make sure that it's actually like, understandable to at least like stick right around here. What's, what's the readability checker that you use? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't pay for it. It's readabilityformulas.com is the one I use. And you want to be fifth grade or under? Fifth grade or under, yeah. Have you, have you played around with things that are... Uh, older quote unquote than that and see that that's the level that it should be at or how did you arrive at fifth grade? Yeah, so I have analyzed thousands of shorts. As you may know. So I've like scraped, you know, just scraped a bunch of shorts and I put it in this readability checker. And I noticed that the most popular shorts, especially Mr. Beast, and Mr. Beast is one of the most short creators, and he's like in the first grade level. So I just basically like after scraping everything, that's when I realized like fifth grade and under it's like about the range you want to be at. Yeah, I think yeah, it's just simply put, yeah.
I do really not think that he's at the average of all of these. I'm not gonna lie, the readability can sometimes be off, but it was um, it was just like at a range because I, I believe like the like air act, for example, was like slightly higher. I don't know the exact number of times, but I I just noticed that like I put in between the three, but. I would say the problem with the readability is especially like for content like mine, you can change the readability from fifth grade to like eighth grade by simply using the word business. So I try to avoid things like that, or use the word finance, or if you use like, for example, profit. Instead of saying profit, I just explain the definition of profit every time I talk about it. I did not know this about you. I did not know that you analyzed thousands of shorts by scraping the titles and the transcripts. Can you tell me more about that? <laughs> yeah, so it's so funny. Because like basically the way I do it is, you know when you go onto YouTube and you open up your short, it sends you like even on desktop, it sends you to like this short page or whatever. But if you change the URL to like watch question mark B equals then the URL, then it will send you to like the actual YouTube page, and then you can just click transcript, copy and paste that transcript, and then I just check the readability. But also like check other things. You know, I just analyze why these shorts are working. So interesting. So interesting. I, yeah. I would love to hear anything else that comes to mind as you're looking at all of this that started to help you pull together your own short strategy because I did not realize that you had done all this research and pulled all this together. This gets me very, very excited. As a creator science guy, I am <laughs> super yeah. excited about this, this research. Yeah, so I've also like deeply analyzed all of my videos and I think that's really important. Everyone has different audiences, so who works for Mr. East? my network right so what i did was like i did my own little experiment like when i knew i wanted to get into shorts i told myself i was gonna upload every day for as long as possible and i think i only got like it, 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 i didn't i didn't get that far but the goal was essentially to upload as much as possible quantity is what makes it quality and i was doing that quantity i would analyze my retention graph and this is just like one example i'll just pull out for you so there was one video after five days I got into 50,000 views from my 